C'est donc le moment de notre... So, this is the inaugural conference given this year by Professor Helen Ruiz Fabri. And I shall introduce you to her. She is, uh, of course, a doctor at University of Bordeaux. We don't all come from Paris. She is a professor at the Sorbonne University, Paris 1. So not everybody's from Paris, but we all end up in Paris. And she is the director of the Max Planck Universe, um, Institute in Luxembourg. I met Helen in a train when she was coming back from Luxembourg a few years ago. And I think this institute was still being built. It was a huge project. And she is the director of the International Law Department. She is an associate member of the Institute of International Law. She has been a president of this institute and she has published a number of books in the field of dispute resolution, but not only. She directs the Max Planck Encyclopedia of Procedural Law published by Oxford University. And she is involved in the World Investment and Trade Journal. She has uh, been very involved in public international law. She's a judge at the Tribunal of International Disputes. And she is part of the Arbitration Court and been involved in European arbitration uh, projects as well. So you see that choosing her for this inaugural conference was obvious. Thank you very much. I have to say that it is an honor for me and a great pleasure for me to address you today. Even though I have given a number of courses in theater, in lecture theaters, this auditorium is nevertheless very impressive. So let it be known that I am a bit scared. I would like to uh, thank Professor Yves Dodé, the president of the curatorium, the secretary general, Professor Jean-Marc Touvenin, as well as the men members of the curatorium and the staff of the secretariat for giving me the opportunity to address you on a subject that is close to my heart, procedural justice and how it interacts with international law. So I will now carry on with what I was saying. So I will talk about procedural justice and the way it connects with international law. So we will look at theory, reality in international law. So talk, talking about procedural justice is also looking to see whether there is a specific fairness requirement associated with procedure. In other, way, in other words, how decisions are taken independently or separately from their content. So as legal experts, intu intuitively, we would say that this fairness requirement is exist. Because after all, we have all been trained to believe in the fair trial or due process. And here I can refer you to a very well-known saying, Justice should not only be done, but should manifestly and undoubtedly be seen to be done. The author of this said that it's important, but also fundamental. So we know that this saying was uh, actually used in a legal decision in England, but the idea was also present internationally and at the same time, because after all, this is still quite recent, it goes back to the 20s. And the advisory uh, committee of the permanent court of international justice was thinking 
about its rules of procedures and wrote, it's not enough merely of some importance, but it needs to look fair. So the judge must be impartial, but his Im or her impartiality must not be suspected by anyone. So very spontaneously, we can see what's at, what's at stake. So there is legitimacy and acceptability of decisions. And I would say that this is particularly true for court decisions as they are a highly public display of fairness. So they reflect in a very condensed way these uh, legitimacy and acceptability concepts. And it's on these legal decisions and on procedure that I will focus my uh, lecture. Of course, we can look at procedural law for international uh, law in general. So before going forward, I would like to say that here I'm dealing with procedural rules as secondary rules as defined by Hart. Looking at the a function to implement substantive law or primary rules. I don't know if you know this distinction, but it's the one I'm using. And I'd like to insist on the functional aspect of my approach, because in reality, the difference between procedure and substance is actually not very uh, clear cut and easy, but this is too complex for me to deal with it in this conference, even though I might come back to it in the conclusion. So in the context of this lecture, I believe that regardless of their nature, rules can have at a certain point in time and in certain uh, contexts, a procedural function. So to think about procedural justice, I suggest we move in uh, four stages. First of all, we will look at the role of procedure. Then in a second stage, we will look at the tools that allow us to assess procedural justice. This is the theoretical philosophical part. And then we will thirdly look at the very specific features of international law before a fourth stage, which will be the conclusion. Initially, I'd like you to think about the role played by procedure. And to do so, we can look at different approaches. We could look at a timeline. So you can look at the role of procedure ex ante, in other words, before decisions or rulings, but also ex post, in other words, following the decision or the ruling. Each situation casts a different light on the role of procedure. If we take the ex ante angle, it shows that primary rules, rules whose goal it is to coordinate the uh, behavior of subjects of law by setting out rights and obligations. These primary rules cannot operate without procedure for, th for three main cumulative reasons. The first reason is that subjects of law only have an imperfect knowledge of the content of law and factual situations. So for example, in a dispute, parties can have different information on the facts. It's therefore uh, necessary to have a process that allows both parties to acquire a common understanding of both the law and the facts. The second reason is that the content of the law is not perfectly specified. It's undetermined. Because rules are of a general nature, but because they are uh, drafted in human language. And this is very clear in international uh, law. We see how languages don't necessarily work together. 
and the translation of words is not always straightforward. So because rules are general and expressed in human language are often incomplete and, ambigu and ambiguous. Subjects of law can therefore have differing opinions on behavior that is required or allowed. So what we need is a mechanism in order to clarify the content of the law and to tailor it to each individual case. The third reason is that subjects of law are partial to their own interests and preferred sets of values. This point affects the previous ones insofar as subjects of law will tend towards looking at a legal content and state of facts in a way that favors their own interests. So you need a process to accommodate and distinguish between these partial and one-sided views. So if you follow my analysis, and if you agree with it, you will agree in uh, saying that procedure is unavoidable. Still in this ex ante view that precedes the decision, it's important to note that jurisdictional procedure belongs to two categories of procedures. If you look at all types of procedures, it belongs to the one of preset procedures, but it also belongs to the category of programming procedures. Now, what does that mean exactly? So it's preset because it entails a certain sequence and a certain code of conduct. And in this code of, con code of conduct, there is a collective component, which applies to all actors involved, and an individual component which defines the re specific requirements for each role. This concept of role is important. In short, to give you an example, what we expect of a judge is that he or she behaves like a judge. So here, the role has to be consistent and we expect that judges will adopt behavioral appropriate standards. Criteria such as impartiality and independence help achieve this by minimizing environmental influence on decision-making. Independence, impartiality uh, help to make sure that the internal uh, role be altered or affected by external factors. For example, if you if the judge knows or is a friend of one of the uh, parties. So that's the programmed procedure aspect. In addition to being uh, programmed, I would say that juris jurisdictional procedure is a programming procedure. It implies that a decision will be reached, but no one knows its outcome beforehand. So it will set out a sequence of events in such a way that this sequence becomes a regulated process. But the process is open-ended. So this open feature is often wrongfully confused with neutrality. I believe that in reality, it shows that procedure includes and orientates processes of negotiation, process of verification, and selection. And it has a closing effect in that it leads towards a decision that closes the process. For this to uh, work, procedure and its outcome need, need to be viewed as legitimate sources of a, authority, even in the case of the losing party, and even in cases where there are errors. And I will come back to this later on. <laughs> 
If we now take an ex post view, in other words, you look at the role of procedure retrospectively after the ruling has been given. Here, the role needs to be looked at in terms of what is expected from a court decision. And here there are two possibilities. The first possibility is if you believe that only outcome or results matter. In that case, expectations will be as follows. Outcomes that are right on the merits, conclusions that are legally right, and factually true conclusions. But if we don't consider that only the outcome matters, then we can add an expectation of fair participation to the process that leads to the decision, or, and also expectations in terms of cost. These different expectations shape the goals attributed to procedure so if I say it's either only outcome matters versus it's not just the outcome that matters, I introduce the idea that these goals need to be considered jointly. And this is what that we see in procedural uh, justice uh, models. And here I'd like to maybe say a few words about these mo models in the second part or second stage of this presentation. The different models of procedural justice that I will mention all reflect one or several values for which a choice needs to be made. So these options are accuracy, that needs to be weighed up against efficiency, cost, and participation. So no single model gives a perfect solution, but if you mention these models, it allows us to identify through their limitations what procedural justice really looks like. I suggest we start with models of procedural justice as identified by John Rawls, who is author of the theory of uh, justice of reference. This is of course criticized by other theories, but as it's the basic one, other authors come back to it. And it's often around this one that the other theories are based. So a few, models are suggested, and I will talk about these uh, different models now in a very simplified way, but that will allow you to see how we can think about this question. To begin with, Rawls identifies pure procedural justice and impure procedural justice, and what differentiates uh, the two is the uh, question of outcome, the result. Is there a fair result as such, one that is uh, defined by a criteria, criterion, and that is the goal to meet? So is, some, is this something that exists? It will be an easier to understand when I talk about the different theories Let's look at what is called pure procedural justice. And here it's the fairness of the procedure that makes the outcome fair. So no specific result is considered fair or not. What makes the outcome right is the fact that the procedure was carried out in a fair manner. The example that Rawls gives is interesting. So he gives the example of lottery tickets. This is pure procedural justice at play. If each ticket gives you, lottery ticket, gives you an equal chance of winning. Nobody can complain that the system wasn't fair. 
So this is a metaphor, a gaming metaphor that we sometimes use. But if you look at what happens in reality, it's not a game. These procedural uh, processes are different. If we look at the case of impure procedural justice, which is my second model, as you gather, it is um, determined by the fairness of the results. So what counts here is the outcome. So there is a specific outcome that is right. And John Rawls here carries out a subdivision between perfect procedural uh, justice and imperfect procedural justice. Procedural justice is perfect when the pr procedure guarantees the right result 100% of the time. And the example provided by Rawls is uh, that of cutting a cake. So the fair result is when you have slices of cake that are equal. And the rule of procedure that allows to us to get this result reliably is the rule according to which the person cutting the cake takes his or her piece last. So here you see the connection between the result and the procedure. So there can be other rules. You could use a protractor to measure the cake, but this would be difficult to do in front of your guests when slicing a cake. In procedural justice that is imperfect, here the result counts. But even if the, you want to try and achieve this fair result, it cannot guarantee it. Not 100% of the time. The example chosen by Rawls is that of a criminal trier. In this case, only those who are guilty are sentenced. The procedure is, is designed to establish the truth, but it's impossible to guarantee that always, it will always lead to the right results because mistakes do happen. It's interesting to note that Rawls only provides one example of jurisdictional procedure, and it relates to the imperfect model. This is very clear when you look at these different models and if you connect them to a dominant value. The key value in procedural justice when it's perfect is accuracy. The core idea of this model is that the goal of the procedure is to seek truth, accurate legal conclusion and establishment of real facts. The problem with this model is the problem of cost. Generally speaking, procedures entail real costs for the parties, but also for the social group that funds the uh, legal service. So this model means that we need to think, how far do we go to get accuracy? Or at what point in time do we stop because an infinitesimal gain in accuracy would have a completely disproportionate cost. And here I'm not only talking about money, but I'm talking about cost in terms of time. Because if it takes decades to reach accuracy, then how can you still talk about a fair outcome? And I'm not even talking about the context or the circumstances that would change over time. So accuracy can be a moving target, so to speak. So accuracy has advantages, but where do we put the limit? The value that is dominant is the uh, weighing up of different costs. And I'd say that usefulness 
is a key value. And I'm basing this on the fact that many theories have looked at this model of procedural justice. So here we have to weigh up two costs. On the one hand, the running costs of the court system, the costs that I mentioned previously, financial and time costs. And on the other hand, there is the other uh, cost, and that's the cost of error or the risk of errors. In other words, inaccurate legal decisions. So the system needs to be able to produce decisions at a reasonable cost or affordable cost, including in terms of time, whilst living with its mistakes. And these mistakes, of course, must not destroy its authority. So the notion of procedure comes down to a balance between cost and the risk of error. In some ways, this model is an answer to the shortcomings of the accuracy model, but it does entail other risks. Finally, the dominant uh, value in pure procedural justice is the question of participation. Subjects of law are affected by a decision and should have the possibility of taking part in the process by which the decision is taken. This value of participation relates to uh, several uh, foundations. It's connected to the right of those affected by a court uh, decision of being treated with respect and dignity. It's a right of political, political nature. Another uh, aspect is the idea that subjects of law see the difference between losing a case and being treated unfairly. I'm sure that this is something that you are aware of. And this is actually backed up by many social psychological studies. So of course, we have to be very careful in the field of international law not to fall into anthropomorphism. But I think the comparison is useful. Particip as, as a other possible ground for participation, there is the question of equality of chances in communicating or possibility of communication as seen by the theory of theory of discourse. So both parties must have the opportunity to express themselves. But here we're getting to the limits of procedural justice. Because in terms of uh, perception, and after all, perception is very uh, important, what is the value in participating if it doesn't have an effect on the outcome? So this is something that is philosophically uh, true, but we know that the, uh, these debates try and narrow down the decisional options given to judges. So participation depends, has an effect on outcomes and on accuracy as well. So I think we do need to bear this in mind. So I showed you these different models to see that each model casts a different light on the values underlying the procedure. Many legal systems in reality try to juggle between these different uh, uh, values and try and find a balance between accuracy, usefulness, cost, and participation. What I'd like to do now is move to a third stage to see what we can uh, do in this, uh, on this subject in terms of international law. So what we see in the case of international law is that there are very specific challenges. Generally speaking, 
looking at justice entails a certain vision of political society. And this is the case in all uh, theories. And if I mention John Rawls's theory, which is very well known, his vision is connected to a specific uh, uh, vision and it's done in terms of uh, liberal democratic societies. And because of the conditions he sets out, his theory cannot be applied to an international context. John Rawls believed that it's not possible to ensure overall just functioning in a society where values are viewed in opposing ways. The only viable approach, according to him, is a minimalist approach based on what he calls an overlapping consensus. And this is quite a narrow uh, definition. It's a minimal agreement on a vision of what uh, justice is. So here what we are going to do is talk about different principles. So the reason I'm explaining this is so that you can understand that even if we're talking about justice theories, they are all relative. Each one is uh, built on identified values. And this is true for procedural justice. Of course, we it doesn't preclude looking at procedural justice and using the tools I uh, uh, mentioned. So this uh, means that it should be done taking into account the limitations and constraints of international law. And the main constraint is the place occupied by the sovereignty of states. So if we go back to the ex ante model I described previously and the ex post model, what do we note? In the ex ante view, the requirements such hopes, it was a case of putting the cart before the horse. I want to be very clear. I'm not saying that only jurisdictional procedure can satisfy the need for procedure. There are other types of procedure, such as negotiation, for example. But from the procedural justice viewpoint, these procedures don't offer much hope in modifying the power struggles at play, and they don't achieve much in terms of uh, fairness, as I explained previously. So the possibility for justice here is quite small. So international jurisdictions uh, were more and more numerous in the 20th century. In fact, we talked about a jurisdictionalization of international law. I think it's important to remember three things. First of all, jurisdictionalization is a recent phenomenon. It's been around for one uh, century, so it doesn't have a deeply anchored tradition. Secondly, jurisdictionalization of international law is a fragile phenomenon. These uh, courts and tribunals only exist by the grace of states. And sometimes these courts 
are prevented from working, even if they're not uh, uh, destroyed. Look at the World Trade Organization. And I would say that a lot of these international courts get their authority from their statutes. And this is based on state consent. We know that states don't give legal rulings the same deference they give to those of their domestic courts. So international uh, courts need to be very careful in terms of the acceptability of their decision when the rulings are compulsory and even more so when it isn't. So when it's not compulsory, then you need to draw the litigants to you. And here, rules of procedure can play a very important role. Finally, third uh, phenomenon is uh, the fact that it's piecemeal. The jurisdictional landscape is fragmented. You've got islands of jurisdictions with a few examples of compulsory ones, but there are many rules with no judges. And if you look at the acrobatics that states have to carry out to try and bring cases before the judge. I need to say that there is nothing that would allow us to talk about international justice in the systemic sense of the word. And I'll come back to this in my conclusions. So this doesn't mean that international courts are powerless, not at all. And it doesn't mean that they can't contribute to procedural justice. In fact, it's the opposite. Because often they fully understand their procedural rules, unlike what is seen in domestic courts. The statutes, the founding text, provide for procedural rules, often in small numbers, and very often courts have to draw up their own rules. So the plane will not land immediately because we did start with a slight delay. So the Secretary General has kindly given me a few more minutes. So I was just saying that most international courts have uh, the powers to self-regulate. Uh, so they have to do this, of course, uh, in compliance with the statute, but they do have a certain margin of maneuver. The, if we look at uh, the uh, Court of Justice of the EU or the Criminal uh, International Court, they don't have this power, but here, what we see is that they do keep a margin of maneuver because in addition to the statute and the rules of procedure, they uh, have additional rules of procedure. They call them directives, guidelines. And even if this is only soft law, these rules do give a real power of orientation. And then we must remember that these courts can interpret the rules of procedures, can interpret the silences in these rules. After all, these rules have certain uh, features and international courts can use the principal generals of procedural law, even if we think that these principles are not very numerous. They also use judicial uh, precedents borrowed from other international courts, even if there is a, a cross fertilization that is maybe not quite as developed as we would like it to be. And they can use their inherent powers to uh, settle procedural matters. So all these factors mean that the power given to judges is uh, great. And it, it means that procedure can be subjected to policy and can carry value choices. The strategic use of procedures 
by the party is well known and everybody thinks it's part of the rules of the game, even if it is criticized. The use <clears throat> that judges make of procedure in order to increase uh, their power or shape the procedure in a way that isn't what was planned by the negotiators of the statute is something that is maybe not very well recognized in its political dimension. But this political dimension is real. Here I have to remain uh, realistic. So international courts have a certain procedural margin, but they have to be very careful in the way they use it. And this is very clear if you look at the situation with an ex post uh, lens. <clears throat> this ex post approach shows that international jurisdic jurisdictional procedure has to accommodate state sovereignty, even for uh, bodies like international criminal courts. So what is clear is that everything counts. Outcome, accuracy, cost, usefulness, and participation, together with very specific orientations that are also paradoxical. First, it's clear that outcome matters. And this explains why states are very reluctant in terms of mechanisms of compulsory jurisdictions. Nobody likes to lose. States don't like to lose, especially in uh, this type of uh, proceedings. And because states don't like to lose, judges have to be very careful. They need to come up with good reasons but they also need to make sure that they lose in the right way. So accuracy is important here. What's uh, interesting is that courts use their investigative powers very cautiously. This is often criticized. We often say they should be more proactive, but usually courts let the parties provide information and evidence. This reluctance is understand because uh, the uh, court, the international courts have very limited powers to obtain evidence. So it's often more a question of cooperation between the parties. If we look at all the de debates that were created um, concerning the use of experts appointed by courts, and the great caution exercised by states, we can see that for international courts, it's very difficult to take initiatives that would favor accuracy. Accuracy is a goal, but international courts can't take that much initiative in this field. If we now look at weighing up these different points, again, here the landscape is varied. Overall, states are in charge of costs, whether it's time or money. If you look at time, and with the expect, ex, exception of urgent procedures, these uh, time frames, calendars, are set with the parties, and they are often adaptable. So what we can say generally is that states are not litigants who are in a hurry. Even when courts do impose time constraints, then there is the question of the ways and means they will use to process the cases. So even if we set aside the litigants cost and we look at the uh, operational uh, cost, it's very easy to see that the social group in other words, the states that created the court and provide its budget is not prone to subsidize the court to the extent that is necessary. States 
actually use this to reduce the importance of the profile of a court or tribunal. And you can see this uh, in the case of uh, human rights institutions that are overloaded with cases. So the reasonable time for a ruling is not a strong point of procedural justice at the international level. And this, of course, has a bearing on procedural justice internationally. If we look at the question of participation, the situation here is even more paradoxical. So there is an institutionalized bias in the makeup of international court because these cases concern one or several states. And this bias is accepted. And the bias is through the presence of a national judge. So this presence indicates a specific limitation in the international order to what should be the dogma of dogmas, procedural justice. So even if it is accepted in principle, there is still a compromise. Participation in procedure is something that goes without saying. And states often use this and sometimes they don't turn up. They don't turn up to a procedure and no jurisdiction can force them to do so. The legitimacy of participation is uh, so strong that courts <clears throat> will wonder if they should take into account the position of a state expressed on the fringe fringes of the proceedings. And here I'd like you to think of the uh, case of the position papers. The rights of the defaulting party are often protected. The question of participation goes much further as we see from the uh, question of opening proceedings to third uh, parties in cases of amicus curiae or uh, civil parties or victims. This decision of opening up to third parties uh, brings up fundamental debates. Is this international justice uh, something that only has a private function of settlement dispute, of dispute settlement, or does it have a more public aspect in terms of ex expectations? But I think what it does is it is, brings up the question of who are the audiences? So an author like Perelman showed that any legal decision has several audiences. For procedural justice, the question is whether the justice system that is seen should be seen by the different audiences. And today we know that this perception comes from the fact that people have been able to be heard and participate. It's often perceived as a democratic uh, uh, process and he, Professor Damrosch will go into this with all the uh, ambiguities. But if we look at um, the different courts, we see that whatever the justification, and here I, with the exception of human rights courts, jurisdictions are often reluctant to open up their proceedings to third parties when the choice depends on them. And here I think we need to give some thought. So procedural justice is under pressure. And I think the situation is also very 
fragmented. This brings me to a couple of conclusions. So my first conclusion is the fact that we need to uh, try and think about uh, procedural justice. And I'm thinking of syncretism. So what is syncretism? This means that the international uh, procedure is born out of a combination of influences or a fusion of elements drawn from different legal systems. And if you look at the statutes of courts, you can see that in terms of their com composition, there are many different legal systems represented. And we can see the impact that this has on procedure. We do know the risks of syncretism, and that is that when you combine different elements taken from different systems, well, then the result is more or less harmonious, and you can't assume any coherence of the international procedure. All comparative law specialists know that when you take a norm out of its uh, source, then the effects it will produce will be quite different. International courts have to manage with this syncretism, and they probably do it each in their own way, depending on their needs and their political agendas. Most of them are specialized courts relating to specific subsystems, and they work also on different geographical uh, levels, regional, national, and it's very difficult to get a consistent result. So what we can say is that each uh, court is probably more centered on the uh, coherence of its subsystem ra rather than on any coherence of the jurisdictional procedure overall. Talking about procedural justice in international law can only be done in very general terms with all the ensuing approximations. And I think we would need a closer analysis to make this diagnosis more precise. This brings me to my second conclusion, which has to do with the distinction between procedure and substance, the merits. There are consequences to labeling a rule either as a procedural or a substantive one. For example, the fact that raising this rule will be considered as a preliminary issue. If you take the immunity uh, case between Germany and Italy before the International Court of Justice highlights, once again, that a procedural rule can block access to the substance, to the merits, even if this substantive law has the dignity of use cogents. More generally speaking, rules identified as being procedural can deflate or inflate the effects of substantive law. So there is a point in calling a rule substantive or procedural. It's not always easy to distinguish substantive law from procedural law. There are many rules that actually straddle both categories, and sometimes they can be considered procedural and other times substantive. In reality, these two types of law are often mixed and interact with each other. It's this interaction that shows that unlike what is often said, procedure is not just the servant of, of substantive law, even if it helps to implement it. So what I've tried to show you, and I hope I've succeeded, is that procedure is absolutely necessary. It is unavoidable. It's not neutral, only neutral technical. It allows choice 
And just as substantive law, it is there to serve values. Therefore, I think it's necessary to keep thinking, thinking even more about international procedural law and the way in which it is confronted with the different theories of justice. Thank you very much.